out of the way, I just want to welcome you all here to today's workshop. And I think today's subject is something that we don't really talk about enough in Ireland, sex and relationships. And it's not just that we don't talk enough about it enough for disabled people, we just don't like talking about it first off. So hopefully today we're starting to change that. Because I think we need to talk and things are going to change. And lots of people in this room have done a lot of talking. Talking to politicians, talking to the Law Reform Commission, talking to service providers, talking to families, talking to each other about the need to change the law and policy in Ireland on disability, sex and relationships. So talking is a good start, but for things to really change, the right people need to be listening, and that's the hard part. We need people in power to really listen, not just pretend to consult disabled people and to trust them to be in control of their own lives. For example, the Connect People Network made a submission to the Law Reform Commission in 2013 on the plans to change the law about consent to sex, and they said, we don't want laws that are about testing us. We want proper sex education. Then we can make our own choices. We don't want special laws for people with extra support needs either. The new law should be disability neutral. It should apply to everyone. We want you to listen to our opinions. We want you to take them seriously. So we couldn't have been clearer than that. And unfortunately, I don't think they were listened to enough or taken seriously enough. And I'll talk more about this in my paper later today, about how the law that was passed this year still means that there are special laws for disabled people about consent to sex that are different from the law for everyone else. So the reality is we all need support for our relationships. We want people to recognise our relationships because they're real and they're important. We need people to help us out when things are tough. And we need people we can go to for advice and support. And that's for everyone, not just disabled people. It's just that sometimes the support disabled people might ask for with their relationships might look a bit different, that's all. Sometimes it seems, to me anyway, that disabled people have to pay a very high price for the support that they need. For many people, getting support often means giving up some or all of their freedom. The first time I think the country as a whole really started to understand this was when uh, Sanctuary First at Play was premiered by the amazing Blue Teapot Company. And I'm so glad that we're able to, to screen the film of Sanctuary this evening. I think it's amazing. I think the play was brought to an even bigger audience then when it was included as part of a documentary called Somebody to Love that aired in 2014 on our national broadcaster. And I remember watching the comments on Twitter when the documentary aired, and so many people were so shocked that in the 21st century in Ireland, disabled people risked being convicted of a crime for having sex. But probably most of you, if you were watching, were not surprised because we've been living with that reality for a long time. In fact, some of the people who you'll hear from later today were writing a book chapter with Kelly Johnson, uh, so German Oak and Joe McGrath about this very problem. And Kelly says in that chapter that people were angry about a law they felt treated them as if they were not adults and could not make decisions. Some group comments within the group included, the law is making me very unhappy. The law is like a military camp, it is very unfair. Gives us no credit for common sense, no freedom. So during all of our discussions today, I want us to remember the importance of equality. We need to keep asking, would non-disabled people accept having their lives and their relationships interfered with like this? And if the answer is no, then something's wrong and we need to fix it. Mark Priestley told me once that the best way to change policymakers' minds is to have both stories and statistics. So we're working on the first part at least today with some really amazing stories and I've been very privileged that we've got two brilliant storytellers and their equally excellent respondents to share their experiences with us today on such an important topic. I remember when the marriage equality referendum was passed feeling delighted, obviously, but also a bit sad because even though it was really important, just to have your relationship recognised is only the first step. It's not the whole story and it doesn't mean that suddenly everyone in Ireland now has full equality and all of their human rights respected all of the time. So we need to start imagining and working towards what that looks like and I think we've got a good place to start with the people in this room. Today's seminar is taking place as part of the Voices Project, and for those of you who haven't been to one of our previous uh, events, I want to say a little bit about the project. Voices aims to bring together people with lived experience who have been denied the right to legal capacity, so that's the right to make their own decisions. And when people are being brought together in this project, they're also being paired with people who have other experiences, whether that's a researcher, an activist, an artist, or a policymaker, who will respond to that individual experience. And we believe that change can only happen when people whose rights have been denied are the ones who get to decide what reform looks like. 
In April last year, we selected 16 pairs of storytellers and respondents from 13 countries around the world, and they're all working together to write about their experiences in making choices or being denied the right to make decisions in their lives, and how things can change for the better. People are sharing stories about their experiences with the criminal justice system, with contract law, with medical treatment, and today with relationships. In November, we're bringing everyone back together to share their experiences, finalise their stories, and they're all going to be written into a book which will be published with Rutledge next year. So if you're interested, you should add the 22nd of November to your diaries because that's the date of the next workshop with all of the pairs back together here in Galway, and that will be a great event. I've developed a bit of a habit at these events of finding a piece of poetry or literature um, that I think reflects some of my hopes for the day and sharing it with you before we listen to our speakers. Um, so today I thought about a poem by Adrian Rich, uh, which is about a, a woman's climbing team. And I just want to read a few excerpts from that poem because part of it really speaks to me about recognising that we need each other to achieve great things. And no matter how many times we're told that our dreams are impossible, people are prepared to put their lives on the line to make things happen. And she's also a quote who writes about, a lot about love and relationships, so I thought that was very relevant for today. She says... When you have buried us, told your story, ours does not end. We stream into the unfinished, the unbegun, the possible. In the diary, as the wind began to tear the tents over us, I wrote, we know now we have always been in danger down in our separateness. And now up here together, but till now we had not touched our strength. In the diary, torn from my fingers, I had written, what does love mean? What does it mean to survive? We will not live to settle for less. We have dreamt of this all of our lives. She also writes about, uh, and has a collection of poetry called, indeed, A Wild Patience Has Taken Me This Far. And I really think that probably disabled people and their allies have been patient for too long, <laughs> for looking for change. But I like the idea of a wild patience, and I think that might be something we can carry with us today as well, driving us to do what we can to show how the world can change and be a different and hopefully better place. So with that, I'll hand you over to Susie, our chair for today. Good morning everyone. Um, my name is Susie Byrne and I am delighted to be here today. I work with the National Advocacy Service for People with Disabilities and I am ashamed to say this is the first time I have been to an event run by the CDLP in Galway and it says something when it's about sex and relationships that finally gets me down here. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. And I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to see so many faces here that I um, recognise from um, lots of different places. Um, yesterday, um, I have a thing, I listen to live line, I know it's awful, but I do. And yesterday, a woman called live line about her daughter. And her daughter was removed from her group home because um, she wasn't receiving the correct support. And there was conflict between her and uh, a man in the house that she shared, and she was moved somewhere else and she no longer has contact with the man but she would like to have contact with him. And that described to me, in a nutshell, a lot of the problems we have around sexuality, relationships, intimacy, feelings, and the issues of disability in Ireland. On the train on the way down last night, with my partner Karen, she's reading the paper and she has this thing of pointing out stories to me and going, did you see this? I haven't seen it. It was a story about a wardship application in the High Court on Monday where the uh, judge m made somebody a ward of court um, and the conditions around his wardship are extremely strict. Um, he can't spend money. He, um, they're, they're going to teach him how to use the internet. That's a course on how to use the internet. Rather than dealing with issues to do with sexuality and relationships which were the basis for the application for wardship, they're teaching him how to use the internet and deny him access to money and his passport and the right to travel. And that's how the court believes that they need to protect him rather than looking at what supports he needs to express himself. And that for me in a nutshell sort of again sort of captured one of the many problems that we have in this country about sexuality, relationships, but also just about choice. And at the moment, there's a huge amount of applications going through wardship because we don't have 
laws to support people to make choices fully enacted. So hopefully today we're going to hear about choice, we're going to hear about people's feelings, and we're going to hear about the law and what's wrong with it, what's right with it, and what we need to do. So I'm really looking forward to this morning. I want to introduce you to Sarah. Sarah is one of the most important people here today because she's the timekeeper, and she's going to keep us all in order, including myself. We're already running late. Okay, I'm delighted our first speaker today um, is Maria Matney. And Maria is from Dublin, has been involved in She's, been, she's from the north side, even better. And um, Marie's been involved in self-advocacy uh, for many years, including recently as sec secretary of the National Platform. Um, and I, I happen to know Maria from visiting um, places where Maria works. And um, knowing Maria, I met her, and so I'm delighted to see her here today. And together with Maria, Sarah, has been working with Maria and is going to respond to the issues that Maria addresses. So Maria, are you going first? I am, yeah. You are? Okay. So, and the title of your presentation is, Is There Any Lawful Impediment Interfering with the Right to Marry? Okay, ready to go? Okay, Maria. I just want to thank you first of all, Maria, for sharing your story with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for being here and to share it with everybody else here as well. Yeah. So we made a poster, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. Um, so your poster is going to help you to tell your story. So let's start at the beginning. Do you want to do you want to stand up and put your family? Oh, yeah, that's good. So, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. Yeah, I want to stand up. You want to stand up? Yeah. Okay, you want to stand, stand up then. How are you? <coughs> so, the first picture, tell me about the first picture up there. How old were you? I was nine. You were nine? Yeah. And where were you born? I was born in um, 70. 1970. 1970. So, yeah, you had your birthday last in July, didn't July, you? July, yeah. So, you're 46. Can we say you're 47? 47. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So you were born in July 1970 <coughs> in Ireland? Yeah, I was. And then what's happening in the next picture? That's, that's me. That's me. My mum's sister. Your mum's sister? Myself. Yeah. yeah. And I'm upset about it. That's your mum and dad yeah. and your godmother, who yeah. was your, who's your mum's sister. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, I'm upset about it. You're upset about that because yeah. your parents are, yeah. they're not here anymore, are they? No. no. So, but unfortunately, both your parents have died. Yeah. What are you doing in that picture? You look like you're getting no, married. No, it's In this one. <laughs> what are you doing? First communion. Oh, first, is that your first communion? Yeah, yeah. Is that important to you? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, anyway, you, you had your first communion, you grew yeah. up. And what's this picture of? You're holding some medals there. I won five medals in Canada and Ohio. You won five medals? In Canada. Yeah. You won, so you won five medals for yes, Ireland? I was, yeah. I know Galway just won the hurling. <laughs> <laughs> So you won five medals for Ireland at the yeah. Special Olympics was, yeah. in America. That's that's amazing. That's yeah. an amazing achievement. <coughs> that that tells about what and what did you do? That tells. I did. I did um, the hula hoop, the ribbon, and the ball. Hula hoop, ribbon, and the ball. Yeah. And you got five medals. Five medals. And you came back, and there was a lot of celebration, wasn't that? Yeah. So I got that kind of like hit on the placement. You had hip replacement. Yeah, I had. Yeah, because of yeah. the gymnastics. Yeah, right. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you came back from America, and there's a picture of you there in the car. With with the lots of people at the airport when you came yeah, back. That's me. That's you there, and it says you won uh, one gold, one th gold. three silver, one silver, and one bronze. One bronze. Okay, excellent. <laughs> So then there's you wearing all your medals. Yeah. Yeah. 
So then, let's move on a little bit. So the next picture, you look like you're in the hairdressers. This me there in the hairdressers. That's you. You did. You have. You did a course. Yeah. So you went to college. College. And you studied. And I studied hairdressing. Hairdressing. Mhm. Yeah. And that's another what me and Catherine set me down. I told her to do a check. She was only nothing. <laughs> ah. Oh, yeah, she's got to get yeah. that way, though, so yeah. it's okay. <laughs> so that was, your, that, was your, that was your teacher, was it, Catherine? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. There's Catherine. There she is, yeah. There's me. I found her in the chair that gave me that. Yeah, that was Pamela. Pamela? Yeah. And that was your graduation? That was my graduation. Mm -hmm. This one here. Mm -hmm. There's my five friends. Now, yeah. Yeah, you do. That's Paul. He's your boyfriend. He's your boyfriend. You want to turn it up, man, so they have sex. Have a baby. Mm hmm. Yeah. Exactly. So you, you tell, tell us about Paul then. Here, here's the first picture of you and Paul. Where did you meet Paul? Oh, my dear. In Castle. You met him at Castle, so yeah. what's Castle? Not everybody will know what that is. It's a factory floor. It's a factory floor. It's yeah. somewhere you, you it's a it's like a day service, is it? Yeah, day service, yeah. Day service that you go yeah. to. I was in I was in Morris. Mm -hmm. And he did Jack. Oh you were in Titanic? Yeah. Putting on a production of Titanic. I know. And how long ago did you meet Paul? I went to there uh, five years now. Five years. So you've been in a relationship with Paul for five years? Yes, I was. And you want to get married? Yeah. And do you, what's, what's stopping you, do you think? I can't stop me for getting married. She's my child. I was going to put your feet down and go over. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've got pictures yeah, of you and Paul. Here. Me and Carl together. We want mm -hmm. to get married. Yeah. Yeah. You've got a picture of a wedding dress there. Yeah, there's a wedding dress. Mm -hmm. And there's a suit. Mm -hmm. And a suit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's me. I was in there. <coughs> you were in Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins. So you and Paul, you've been in Mamma Mia. Mamma Mia. And you played? So for me to play. And that married. Exactly. <laughs> so you you got married in yeah. Mamma Mia yeah, yeah, yeah. and to Paul. Yeah. And you 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 seem to be cast a lot as the leading roles. You were in Titanic yeah, and then you were cast as Mamma. People at the day centre at Castle they know you're in a relationship, do they? Yeah. Yeah. I do. They do. So you're openly in a relationship. Yeah. And you're cast as the leading role. Yeah. That's me the cat woman. Oh, that's you the cat woman? I knew the other cat. Um, Caribbean. Oh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Pirates of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And there's me and Paul together. And Did we're you? in love together. You're in love? Yes. So, Paul, you love Paul? I love Paul, but I want to marry him. You want to marry him? Does yeah. Paul love you? Paul loves me very much. He loves you very much? Yeah, and I still love his family. Mm -hmm. And so he asked you to marry him? I said yeah. And you said yes? Yeah. Okay. Mm. That's great, Maria. Yeah, okay. Do you want to say anything else? I just want to say thanks to do I just want to say thanks to do, say thanks to do the party for me. I had a ball in house. It's thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for sharing with us. Okay, so um, we've heard Maria's story. Um, I titled my response, um, Is There Any Lawful Impediment? Because obviously that's something that's, well in the UK, I'm from England by the way, so um, in the United Kingdom that's something that's said at the marriage ceremony and I believe it's said in Ireland as well and I'm sure people that are from other countries there's a similar translation of that kind of uh, sentence. So is there any lawful impediment? 
interfering with the right to marry. Um, I wrote that because um, I was referring, there was an article, it was published in The Guardian, um, actually it was 2014, and it was a story about a couple that reminded me of Paul and Mary actually. Um, mm -hmm. there was a, there's, a, there's a man and uh, a, a young woman, they want to get married, and it says, I be wed unless adult social care puts stop to it. A controversial test of capacity can deny marriage to couples with disabilities. So this is a common problem, this is not an Irish based problem, this is clearly a, a common problem. And um, somebody from MENCAP, which is a campaigning organisation for people with learning disabilities in the UK, said for someone to have, with learning disabilities, to have their right to marry interfered with is heartbreaking. And I think we, we know it's absolutely clear that Maria and Paul have been in a relationship for five years, yeah. they clearly love each other, yeah. and they would like to get married. So I start to say, well, is there any lawful impediment? Is there a reason that legally that's stopping them from getting married? Um, so I started, the starting point was looking at the Convention for the Rights of People with Disabilities because that's what this project is about. And um, just basically, I'm not a lawyer by the way, I'm, I, I'm a nurse by background, so... Forgive me if I get any uh, legal details slightly wrong and you please correct me. Um, but basically, Article 12 and under the Convention guarantees people um, equal recognition before the law. So that's everybody, regardless of disability. So basically, you just have to qualify for that, you just have to be a human being. So we all qualify for that. And legal capacity is designed as, uh, has been defined as the ability to hold rights. So you can have rights, but also to be able to exercise those rights. And I think about that as in like, it's no good giving somebody something. You can give somebody something but say, you can't use it though. You can have this, but you mustn't use it. So you have to be able to exercise your rights in order for them to mean anything at all. Article 23 also guarantees the rights <coughs> of people with disabilities to marry. And also, there's a duty on the state to take appropriate measures to eliminate discrimination with regard to marriage. So looking at it from that point of view, there's not really any problem. However, <clears throat> we then, I thought, well, we have to look at what are the legal requirements in Ireland. So, basically, there's three... There's three prerequisites to getting married here. Um, to contract a legally valid marriage in Ireland, you must have the capacity to marry each other. You must freely consent to the marriage, yeah. and you must observe the necessary formalities. Okay, so that doesn't seem too tricky. Shouldn't, shouldn't be much of a problem. Having the capacity to marry means you need to well, I'll talk about mental capacity in a minute, but it means basically you mustn't be married to anybody else because if you've already married, you haven't got capacity to marry another person, etc. And you must be of a certain age. So, let's have a look. To capacity to marry. And there's, I got this from uh, Citizens Information Island. All this information. So, Basically, to have the capacity to marry, you have to fulfil all the following requirements. I'm going to relate this to Maria and Paul in a minute. Uh, both parties must be over 18. Are you, are you and Paul both over 18? No, I'm only 47. I'm 47. You're 47, yeah, so you're, you're quite a bit over 18, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah you are. So I think you fulfil that requirement. You need to give three months notification of the marriage. So that's just a formality, a bit of paperwork that you need to complete. Um, you need to clearly not be married, you need to be single, divorced or have a civil annulment. You must have the mental capacity to understand the nature of marriage and you mustn't be related by blood um, uh, or marriage to a degree that would prevent you in law from marrying. So you can't marry your mother's brother or your father's sister, etc. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or your auntie, exactly. Yeah, you didn't marry your auntie, exactly wrong. No, no, no. So, Ronnie Harris. <laughs> so, let's look at, go back to Marie and Paul. <coughs> Do you want me to turn it off? No, I can't. It's on. 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 It's
legal capacity, so I'm sure with support that's perfectly possible. Must be either single, widow, divorced, or have a civil annulment. Neither of you. have not been married before, have you, Maria? Mm. Has Paul been married before? Yeah. No. Yes, it's the first time we can to me. <laughs> <laughs> Must not be related by blood or marriage. <coughs> and then we've got this tricky little <laughs> number here. Got to have the mental capacity to understand the nature of marriage. So you've got legal capacity, <coughs> but there's a possible restriction of legal capacity based on actual or perceived mental capacity. Okay, so that's the capacity to marry. I'm going to come back to this, this issue about legal and mental capacity in a moment. You also have to freely consent. However, and again, this is taken from the um, citizens' information guidance, free consent may, may be absent if at the time of the marriage a person is suffering from a number of things, including mental disability, to the extent that he or she is not able to understand the implication of marriage. So potentially, Maria has to demonstrate understanding of the nature of marriage and the implications of marriage, only because she's got a learning disability, the extra bit. So I uh, just want to have a quick um, bit of audience participation here. Can you put your hand, I'm not going to ask you any personal questions, don't worry. Put your hand up if you have, if you are or have ever been married or in a civil partnership or some. Okay, quite a few. So, um, can you keep your hand up? Keep your hand up if you remember having to demonstrate the other's understanding of the nature and implications of marriage to somebody acting in a professional capacity. <laughs> oh, I think that's a good point there. Yeah, it's, it's basically it's clearly discriminatory and it's status based. If you if you have a mental illness, if you have an intellectual learning disability, you have to prove yourself over and above everybody else, as we know, so... Mental capacity and legal capacity. Well, there should not be any... According to the Convention of the Rights of People with Disabilities, General Comment 1, this has been discussed. And it's, there should be no restriction of legal capacity based on actual or perceived mental capacity. Clearly, legal capacity is fixed. You have it. You can't take it away. Mental capacity is not an objective, scientific, naturally occurring phenomenon. There's a lot of um, subjectivity in capacity assessments. It depends who's going to complete the assessment, what they're looking for, what their agenda is. It's contingent on social and political contexts and as are the disciplines, the professions, and the um, practices which play a dominant role in assessing mental capacity. So, unfortunately, we, this leads us to sort of further questions. If somebody, who's going to determine whether somebody has the capacity to marry? Who, who makes that decision? It's only the two people concerned. Exactly, it should just be the two people concerned. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Who determines if somebody's able to give free consent at the time the of marriage? The two people concerned. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It should be. What's the required amount of knowledge and insight 
What, how much knowledge and insight do you have to prove? I mean, some of these questions, they're quite sort of philosophical and esoteric, aren't they? What's the nature of marriage? What are the implications of marriage? There could be a hundred different answers. Ask a hundred people and they might give you a hundred different answers. So how are we going to measure the insight and, and the understanding of the nature and implications of marriage? And what about the non-discrimination principle? Why are we applying additional tests to people because they've got a learning disability? Well, I, 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 did, some, I did some research, obviously, to, to find my answers, to find my responses, and I found myself in a labyrinthine world of Irish websites, policies, uh, law, and um, different guide. found quite a lot of different guidance, actually. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to sort of finish on these couple of very opposing um, examples of guidance that I saw. So, the Department of Social Protection website, which is an Irish governmental website, they state that Ooh. mental illness <coughs> and or intellectual disability is an impediment to marriage. Just so it's clear, it's an impediment. Um, one or both of the parties is incapable by reason of intellectual disability of understanding the nature and the effect of the marriage contract. But what really interested me was it says a medical report is required to establish the facts in some cases. So there we've got one of our dominant professions already elbowing their way in the medical profession as always. So you'd have to get a medical report to state whether or not you have capacity to get married or not. <laughs> Yeah. Um, we were talking about this yesterday actually with Eleanor because I was saying, well, because I, I highlighted this and Eleanor said, that's not legal. I don't think that's legal. I don't think they can say that. It's not right. Um, so we did, a bit, we did a bit more digging. And the current law on marriage in Ireland um, is the Civil Registration Act 2004. It says there's an impediment to marriage if the marriage would be void due to the, and excuse my language, but this is the language that is still used, Marriage of Lunatics Act 1811. So, if somebody, that's an impediment to marriage, if the marriage would be void to the marriage because of the Marriage of Lunatics Act 1811, which is basically at a notification meeting, so when you have to notify the registrar of your intention to marry, it means that somebody, well, both parties have to say there's no impediment to marriage. But it means that anybody can object to the marriage on the basis of the Marriage and <coughs> Politics Act. Somebody can say, hey, I don't think these people have got capacity to marry. Yes, yeah. yes you have. Exactly. But again, that's open to anybody. Why does anybody have the right to say whether somebody can get married or not? Well, anyway. Exactly. It's your choice, Maria. Um, the head registrar, registrar the, well, then you have to have a medical report. This is where the medical report comes in. You have to have a medical report, and then the head registrar then decides if it's a valid objection or not. So, Inclusion Island, they stay on their website. There's no provision to assess capacity to marry prior to the marriage of two persons. Typically, an assessment of a person's capacity to marry is made upon the breakdown of a marriage, <coughs> which seems very odd as well. That why would you assess somebody's capacity to marry? When I'm sure if you, I won't ask you again, but have you ever done anything and thought, what was I thinking? Why did I marry that person? You know? Well, if you assess somebody's capacity to marry on the breakdown of a marriage, most people will say, yeah, I don't know why I got married to that person. I'm like, I don't know what I was thinking. So it seems rather um, odd to do that. But it does say, there's some hope, at present there are no reported cases of a annulment of marriage on the basis that a person lacked capacity because of intellectual disability. So although these laws are here, it doesn't sound like anybody's marriage has actually been challenged. So, basically, I believe that um, the duty should not be on Maria to prove that she understands the implication of marriage over and above the requirements that anybody has, um, but it should be on the state 
to ensure that she has the education and resources required for her to enter into marriage if she chooses with the person that she chooses to. Thank you. I agree. I learned a lot there from that presentation. Thank you very much, Marie, and thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, nobody, and it is true, nobody ever asked me to <coughs> enter into a civil partnership if I understood it. They were more, I mean, we were having a huge debate about identity cards, passports, and the like in Ireland at the moment. They were more interested in that um, than they were whether we actually understood what we were handing our money over to and saying in front of everybody. So we now have a few minutes for questions and answers, and um, I think there are roving mics. Do you want to take it? So now we're going to hear from Dr. Sinead Ring. And Sinead is from, um, she comes to us as senior lecturer from Kent Law School, which is part of the University of Kent. And she teaches about evidence, sexuality, gender, and the law, and the law and literature, and she also researches the ways in which the law deals with people who have been sexually abused in the past. So, Sinead today is going to talk about the many sides of consent. Thanks very much, Sinead. Thank you very much, Susie, um, and thanks very much to Sarah and Maria for a wonderful presentation. Um, found it very effective and effective. Um, and thanks very much to everyone for organising this conference and for inviting me. To, I feel very privileged to be here and to be able to speak to you all and engage in really interesting conversations on a personal level for many reasons and on a professional level as well. So thank you. Uh, okay, so I've called it the many sides of consent or the boring title is that, Consent and Intimate Relationships. My background, um, as Susie said, is in the area of criminal law and evidence law, where my focus tends to be on situations where the law may intervene or may hamper attempts for victims of sexual violence to get justice. So <coughs> this conference I'm presenting here has uh, involved a shift in focus for me because I'm thinking about things from a different perspective. Um, really looking at protecting people, but also looking at how the law can empower people to have healthy sexual relationships. And I would preface what I say with a uh, feminist disclaimer of, you know, I don't think the law is a silver bullet, and I don't think the law um, is the answer to everything and how we should behave. But I think that sometimes it does send messages out to society um, about what's important or what society thinks is important. And it can help us structure relationships in, in a new way, or at least think about doing that. My own background as well, I should say, as well as being a lecturer and researcher, is around working with young people. So I teach in university, teach students from the age of 18 up to 90. I think I was my oldest student. Um, but most people are young, like 18 to 25. And these people, men and women, are coming into the world of the university having uh, limited sexual experiences and not quite sure how to navigate the world as adults. Um, and they're constantly being bombarded with different messages from society around what's appropriate sexualized behaviour. So, um, to make a long story short, I'm advocating with people, other people in the university around creating various kinds of interventions um, around harassment, domestic violence and sexual violence. So the whole continuum of, of intimate personal relationship violence um, and that includes same-sex relationships, relationships um, where people are of fluid gender or transgender, uh, heterosexual relationships. Um, and we're really interested in talking to young people about how they can have healthier relationships and how they negotiate um, having relationships where they're clear about what they want, clear to themselves about what they want in a relationship, and they're clear with the other person about what they want. 
um, it's all really about communication and one of the key ways we're talking to young people about communication in, in universities is around consent. The other part of the picture is around bystander intervention, which is where um, somebody who sees something happening that they're not happy with tries to intervene. And that could be a racist situation or an, or an instance of laddish, so-called laddish behaviour. Anything, but it's about <laughs> essentially giving young people confidence to intervene in situations in which they're not happy. So, Today I'm going to talk about consent. Uh, and I'm not used to this. Oh, I do Return really, essentially. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I want to just open up a conversation maybe that we can continue in the questions and answers about what do we mean about consent when we're talking about consent. Um, and I'll give you the legal definition in a minute, but essentially it's about communication and it's about getting permission from the other person or communicating permission to the other person about what you want to happen with your body. Very basic, okay? Um, it's important for people in all kinds of intimate relationships um, and all kinds of people. Um, and like when we're talking about consent, we're talking about everything from kissing to uh, touching to penetration to of all kinds. And the focus in recent years around feminist activism, around sexual violence, as I would so call it, um, has moved towards a focus on consent and that debate could be framed in terms of a move away from talking about sexual offences as involving physical violence, um, which I think is correct, absolutely correct, and more towards a focus on autonomy and a breach and a sexual offence being a breach of somebody's autonomy, personal dignity and autonomy. Yeah, so that's where I'm trying to frame, I suppose, the, the idea of consent. So, this is the new definition that somebody mentioned that there's been a new act, a new statute passed in 2017, earlier this year, I think it was in March, um, the Criminal Law Sexual Offences Act 2017, and for the first time we have a statutory definition written down in law, um, that, and that's it there. A person consents to a sexual act, if he or she freely and voluntarily agrees to engage in that act. And it's really nice to see the he or she there actually, um, even though you could probably have they as well, but in the English Act, which was passed in 2003, which is called the Sexual Offences Act, they use gender neutral language, which means they use the male pronoun, so they use he, but anyway, it's just, <laughs> um, so it's nice to see her and she there. So we've never had a statutory, we've never had a written definition of consent in the law, in, a, in the written legislation before now. Um, and as I say, in England they passed such a definition in 2003, but it's nice for us, it, it's really good to see it written down. So I was talking earlier about the, uh, the messages that law sends out to the world, and this is a very strong message that actually it's really important for us to now be talking about consent and what it means, and it's enshrined in law. How this definition will get worked out in law is yet to be discovered, <laughs> I guess. But, it's good that it's there, and the words freely and voluntarily and agreement are there. Okay? Um, again, these words probably need to be uh, interpreted in, by the courts, but freely and voluntarily I think we can take as um, taking their ordinary meaning. Um, that's the English law definition. Person consents so if he agrees by choice, so he, he agrees by choice and has the freedom and capacity to make that choice. So they're bringing in words like capacity straight away into the definition, which is which is interesting. Um, so why is it important? It's about making sure both partners, or multiple partners, if there's more than two people engaged, um, want to have, are happy, and they want to engage in sexual behaviour. Um, importantly, it's about mutual agreement, and we saw the word agree was in the Irish text. It's not about submission, and that may seem obvious to you, should, you know, but actually it's not obvious to a lot of lawyers, so, it's not always about submission or acquiescence is another word that's used. 
it's about agreement. So yes. So what do you mean by submission? What do I mean by yeah. so? There has been, yeah, giving in is another way of putting it. Yeah, submission is a word, actually, yeah, that is a kind of a strange word. Giving in um, or kind of saying nothing and letting it happen. Yeah. And actually, the law would have had a lot of headaches about whether or not that was actually in consent or not. So, you see the word, it's really good to see the word agreement, I think, in Irish law. Um, and hopefully the courts will not try to bring in the idea of letting something to your body by the back door, okay? Is that alright? Yeah, the, I, I understand, like, cause, like the way active consent rather than submission. Yeah, well I'm going to come back to active, so they don't use the word active, um, unfortunately. <laughs> but, you know, I would like to, I would certainly agree with you that that should be what they mean. <laughs> um, okay, so consent is not about um, taking the broad view of a relationship over the years and saying, oh, well, should I marry or, oh, should I go out for five years, therefore they all, they always want to have, have sex with each other. That's not that the case. You may be married to somebody, you may be dating somebody, or maybe friends with somebody for years, and may not want to have sex with them this particular evening. Yeah? Or you may, um, you may start having sex with someone and decide, actually, I don't want to have sex with them. No, I want to stop. That's perfectly okay too, and the law does recognise that. Okay, so it's, it's focusing on specific moment um, and not the ongoing relationship, and it can be withdrawn at any time during the activity. And that had, there have been cases around that, around you know ongoing sexual intercourse, and then someone withdraws their consent during the sexual intercourse <coughs> if the other partner is to continue. Well, that's. That's an offence, that, that is rape or that is sexual assault. They don't force them. Pardon? Don't, don't force, force them. them, exactly, yeah, don't force them. Very good, yeah. So, again, this is just other words that I've come across. Um, the CPF, the Crown Prosecution Service in the United Kingdom, in England and Wales, ran a campaign on Twitter around what is consent, and lots of actually <coughs> student groups are running campaigns like this, especially at this time of year when students are starting university. And these are some of the words that came up and, and are coming up on the internet. You may have other words, actually, um, for this. So, but mutual is really important. Loving is not, it's maybe romanticizing, but that's another way of looking at it. Active, is somebody mentioned active? It's not optional. It's not optional. Um, it's an essential part of sexual activity if it's going to be non-criminal. Um, mutual acceptance applies to men and women and transgender people um, and <coughs> applies for permission, or it involves asking for permission all of the time if we're thinking about the person in this age. Okay, so, um, so no means no is one way of thinking about it, yeah? No means no. And, and this is one way of saying, well, consent is a really valuable concept. I'll come back to this in a minute. Cons the reason why consent may be seen by a lot of feminists, a lot of people, as um, being a valuable way of thinking about sexual activity and the law and relationships is that, you know, it's a clear statement. If you don't have consent, well, then that's illegal activity. It's criminal activity. So I'm going to come back to the cup of tea video that I'm going to play at the end as well, which is something that we use as a clear statement in our um, advocacy with students around what is and isn't consent. And it's a really helpful video. Some of you may have seen it already. Have you? Cup of tea? Yeah. It's around the idea of, well, if you don't get, if you wouldn't give somebody a cup of tea without asking them and getting their permission, would you? Would you force it? Though? So <laughs> why would you do that with sexual assault or, or with sexual activity? Um, but the, the critique of that, or the criticism of that from feminists is, um, and from other people as well, is that consent can become a minimum threshold above which um, men or people, other people um, <coughs> frame their behaviour and everything above that is okay. okay. So it can become something that is the bottom line, essentially, and everything above that is, is fine, and that's actually not acceptable. We need to think about more positive ways of framing relationships that involve both partners actively. Um, 
Yes means yes is another way of thinking about the value of the concept of consent in law. Um, and, and again, only yes means yes. So we, a lot of people talk about things like enthusiastic consent. Um, you know, asking people, is it okay if I touch you here? Is it okay if I kiss you? Good. Yeah, what's wrong with that? Why is wrong with doing that? Nothing. Um, nothing. Yeah, it's quite simple, isn't it? Is it okay? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, or I would like to kiss you, or I would like to take your shirt off. Would you like that? Would you also like that? So communication. You could invite them to do something for you. Like, can would you give me a back massage, please? Yeah, or, a cup of tea. or a cup of tea. <laughs> yeah, if you're not really. Yeah. A few points. Exactly. Three points. Exactly. Um, and then there's also, so that's very verbal communication, there's also non-verbal communication which is very really body language and that can get um, controversial because of course some people are better at reading body language than other people and so you're into an area then where it may be more difficult to find out whether or not a person is consenting. <coughs> yeah. Now, when I say all this kind of stuff, like, and, and, and I usually get, and you were very <laughs> Um, mature about it, but I usually have my 18 and 19 year olds laughing and giggling and so, you know um, and they they think quite a few of them actually get very defensive around this when I say well why don't you just communicate about it and ask each other what's wrong with that and there's such a barrier sometimes for some people obviously you're you know you're a very mature audience and you're um, emancipated and you're, you're free, you don't see any problem with communication around this stuff. But some people do, and I think that's part of this element of uh, society or elements of society or maybe the culture is such that it's actually impossible to imagine to really open communication around sexual uh, activity. And that's one of the things that I suppose we try to challenge through bystander intervention and through talking about consent openly to everyone. Um, you know, what actually is the problem with asking someone, can I take your top off or can I touch your breast or whatever it is, okay? Um, so, a bit wordy there, so I'll just explain it. Um, You may want to, you know, encourage your partner to say no as well as yes. So you may want to say, well, you know, are you happy to for me to do this? And they say yes, and be specific about what it is that this is. But then you can also say, you know, I really am attracted to you, and I'm really happy that we're having um, an intimate relationship, and we are um, doing this, and I'm really. Um, conscious or I really want you to feel safe and committed and happy with me. So if you don't feel comfortable or you want me to stop, can you tell me to, can you tell me that please? Yeah, just really basic um, stuff. Or slow down, tell me to slow down or ask, you know, tell me to stop if you don't like something. Okay? So, and of course again, another part of this idea of enthusiastic consent or active <coughs> consent is the idea that if you are trying to Trying to get consent, just to put it in long terms, um, you know, only take an enthusiastic yes, <coughs> yes, um, no, maybe, or nothing at all. This is where this links back to your question about submission. It's not consent, yeah. And this is so you can see we're we're using the law here to try and educate people as to what is and isn't appropriate behaviour, what isn't isn't positive, healthy behaviour. Um, and even a hesitant yes, that has to be taken. We would argue it has to be taken as a no. Um, give people time to think about it. You know, oh well, you seem hesitant now. Let's let's just stop now and have a have a cup of tea. <laughs> let's stop or take this up tomorrow, etc. Okay? There will be there will be other chances. Um, and then when we're thinking about the other side of it in terms of. Giving, giving enthusiastic consent, although I recognise that it's a back and forth the whole time during an encounter. Um, sorry, um, you know, thinking about saying no is about how you feel about your body. So when I'm talking to young people about consent, it's about how they feel about their body. So if they feel, okay, I'm not happy with whatever is happening, I'm going to say no. I'm just trying to encourage people to be empowered. 
And that includes every stage from kissing to every, every different stage of the sexual encounter. Okay? And you can also let people know if you're shy about talking to, about consent. So, um, I think consent is a really useful concept for people like me um, who are trying to talk to young people um, about, about healthy relationships. <laughs> what it does is it gets people away from ideas of submission as being okay, as equal to consent. It gets people away from um, ideas that, well, it's not rape if somebody didn't kick and shout and scream. Yeah? Or if they didn't actively say no and try to look for a yes instead. <coughs> so it's really useful actually for teaching, and I usually teach young lawyers about the, about the law and consent, but it's also really useful for talking to anyone about healthy sexual behaviour. Um, so some people don't like to use the idea of consent. I mentioned a few criticisms earlier. There are further ones here around um, consent being too narrow, too legalistic. Yeah, that it's actually too um, narrowly focused to actually encompass the kinds of imbalances of power in relationships that may happen, um, including, you know, somebody may say yes because they have no money and they're married to somebody who is their main source of income. That's not a real yes. And so the law has to be, or lawyers, when they're talking about these things, have to be conscious of going behind a yes as well, or going behind so-called or presumed pres uh, permission. Um, a big thing for me when talking to young people is, is around drinking, drugs and sexual intimacy and whether or not people um, are actually checking if the other person is able to give consent in that sense. Um, and then there's also you know, questions around what people are um, consenting to and the risks that they may be running and whether or not they understand them. I wanted to draw um, links between the current um, conference and what we're talking about here today in terms of people with disabilities and sexual intimacy <coughs> and myths around the criminal justice system and um, sexual intimacy in general. So, um, as you already know, probably myths are ideas that are not true, basically. They're widely held, but they're not true. So, I mentioned one earlier, the idea that it's rape if you... Oh, oh, sorry, it's not rape if... Uh, there was no kicking or shouting. That's not true. That's a myth. That has to be combated. And I think the way of talking about consent that is really flourishing, not just in my head or in my classes, but actually on social media and in uh, student activism in universities, and I think in, in this context, in this debate as well, is really um, positive. It's really empowering. I really like this definition of consent, I just brought it up because I really liked it. It's from Project Respect. Consent is a mutual verbal, physical and emotional agreement. So that idea that sex is not just about putting bodies into a into, um, material relationship with each other, it's actually about emotional um, engagement. Yeah. It's about an emotional <laughs> encounter as well. And that consent is a whole body experience and a whole body concept that we need to think about. That happens without manipulation, threats or head games. So it's aimed at young people, no kind of head game or um, manipulation. So I'm going to, just before playing the consent cup of tea video and then I'll sit down, I just wanted to say that um, I think it's a useful concept. I think there are problems with it. I'm constantly highlighting those problems, but I don't think that that means that we should get rid of the idea of consent, at least for now. It is narrow, it is not legalistic, it does fail to take account of um, imbalances of power in other contexts and personal contexts and social contexts around decision making in sexual relationships. But in terms of a tool for thinking about and communicating to other people and using um, <coughs> using narratives of law and using the, the kind of authority that using the word law brings, consent as it's enshrined in the law and as it's enshrined in case law and as it's used by people teaching in universities, I think is a very useful concept and I think it's one that has been very helpfully taken up by students in their activism around this. So I'm going to play this and hopefully you find it interesting.
If you're still struggling with consent, just imagine instead of initiating sex, you're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they go, oh my god, fuck yes, I would fucking love a cup of tea, thank you. Then you know they want a cup of tea. If you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Uh, then you can make them a cup of tea, or not, but be aware that they might not drink it. And if they don't drink it, then, and this is the important part, strong. don't make them drink it. Just because you made it doesn't mean you're entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say no thank you, then don't make them tea. At all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. They just don't want tea, okay? They might say, yes please, that's kind of you. And then when the tea arrives, they actually don't want the tea at all. Sure, that's kind of annoying, as you've gone to all the effort of making the tea, but they remain under no obligation to drink the tea. They did want tea, now they don't. Some people change their mind in the time that it takes to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk. And it's okay for people to change their mind. And you are still not entitled to watch them drink it. And if they're unconscious, don't make them tea. Unconscious people don't want tea. And they can't answer the question, do you want tea? because they're unconscious. Okay, maybe they were conscious when you asked them if they wanted tea. And they said yes, but in the time it took you to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk, they are now unconscious. You should just put the tea down. Make sure the unconscious person is safe. And this is the important part again. Don't make them drink the tea. They said yes then, sure, but unconscious people don't want tea. If someone said yes to tea, started drinking it, and then passed out before they finished it. Don't keep on pouring it down their throat. Take the tea away. Make sure they're safe, because unconscious <laughs> people don't want tea. Trust me on this. If someone said yes to tea around your house last Saturday, that doesn't mean they want you to make them tea all the time. They don't want you to come around to their place unexpectedly and make them tea and force them to drink it going, but you wanted tea last week or to wake up to find you pouring tea down their throat, going, but you wanted tea last night. But if you can understand how completely ludicrous it is to force people to have tea when they don't want tea, and you're able to understand when people don't want tea, then how hard is it to understand it when it comes to sex? Whether it's tea or sex, consent is everything. And on that note, I'm going to go make myself a cup of tea. <laughs> Thank you very much.